Hello. There we go. I had to be sure the mic was off while I was singing because you don't want to hear that. All right. <laughs> <It's> just <laughs> oh, again, so good to be here with you guys. If you're here for the first session, my name is Brian Osborne from Answers in Genesis. We'll get to that here in a minute. But I get to do a little bit more introduction, take my time just a little bit here, kind of going through about, about who I am and just connecting with you guys in that sense. Uh, before we go into the ministry and who we are as a ministry, first got to show you this. That is my family. Those are my greatest earthly blessings by far. That's my wife Marla of 24 years this past June. You say that's impossible. She doesn't look that old. We married when we were 12 or whatever. Okay, so. <laughs> and uh, my daughter Macy, who's four. My son Ian, who is eight. And I love them to death. I really could not love anybody anymore. So blessed. And so we've had many adventures in our lives. Uh, but such a wonderful blessing. They would have actually come, uh, most likely, because we're not that far away, but we're leaving as soon as I get back home from this to my parents' house in North Carolina, which is another long trip. So I didn't want too many trips back to back. But that's a more accurate picture of my kids. And your parents know how that is, right? Yeah, that's nice and sweet. And bam, there you go. Um, <laughs> and then recently a wedding, my actually my nephew's wedding. Oh, my goodness. But anyway, there they are. And then... As mentioned earlier, I was a teacher. I taught Bible history for 13 years in a public school over in Hickson, Tennessee. And my wife taught in public schools as well for a very long time. And I joined Answers in Genesis roughly eight, a little over eight years ago. And so our ministry, we are an apologetics ministry, which does not mean, by the way, that we're encouraging Christians to apologize for their faith. All right, that's not it at all. The word apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, uh, found in 1 Peter 3, 15, which means the word itself means to give a defense. It has the idea of a lawyer in a courtroom articulating why he believes what he believes about the case. And so it's that giving a defense. It's a very, in that sort of powerful way. That's really the idea. And so our goal as a ministry is to equip Christians to give a defense. And here's the key, where the attack is occurring today. Uh, and really understand where that attack is occurring, how to defend there. And so that's our passion. We do this in a whole bunch of different ways. We have speakers like myself who travel around and speak uh, multiple places, venues, churches, conferences, stuff like that. <clears throat> and then we have the attractions and other resources. But I look at the attractions now. If you ever get a chance to go, I would so encourage you to go first to the Creation Museum. That's part of Answers in Genesis. The botanical gardens are gorgeous this time of year. They really are. They just do an incredible job. If you like plants and gardening and that sort of stuff and flowers, you're going to love that section of the museum. So much to see there. And then the museum itself is a 75,000 square foot walk through biblical history. Got a little petting zoo there as well, by the way. Kids love that. The zip lines are also a lot of fun. Playgrounds are incredible. But the museum itself, you're walking through biblical history with the seven seas. And as we walk you through biblical history, we are answering the skeptical questions of this age. If the Bible is true, what about evolution? What about the ape men? What about the age of the earth? What about rock layers and fossils? And who did Cain marry? And so all those sorts of questions. And we're showing people that there are answers that make really good sense. And science confirms the Bible again and again. And we use all these things to proclaim the answer of Jesus Christ. So if you get a chance to go, again, it's not that far from here. The museum is about an hour and a half from here. Uh, so with going to the planetarium, special effects theater, there are different speakers every day. We have workshops. There's so much to do. If you can spend a good two days at the Creation Museum, you really can. Especially if you don't have little kids, all right? <laughs> if you got little kids, they're going to pull you through a little quicker. But if you can stop and read and take it in, a good two days. But so much going on there. So much being added to the ministry. I'm so blessed by that. So if you get a chance, the Creation Museum is absolutely wonderful. It truly is. And then, of course, what we're more known for, though, a lot of people have been more familiar with this, is that the, we built a replica of Noah's Ark, a life-size replica, the actual size of the Ark by the biblical dimensions. And we got the Answers Center, the auditorium where we do lectures from. And the Answers uh, or the Ark Encounter is absolutely incredible. Uh, and what it does for so many people is make the Bible come to life in a very tangible way. You walk up and you see the Ark with its biblical dimensions. You think, wow, that was a real ship in real history that was really designed to survive a real global flood. And it could have done the job, just what it needed to do as God had told Noah what to do. And so we got a really good zoo there. You can do camel rides, kind of bumpy, but they're fun, all right? You got cool things like lemurs and ostriches and kangaroos over there. You can check all that out. And then the exhibits are so well done. So you've got many great exhibits, the artwork. By the way, the, what you're looking at there, the artistry, the painting, the sculptures, that's all done by our artist at the ministry. Some wonderfully talented people to make all that come to life in amazing ways. 
And by the way, if you need a job, we're hiring, all right? Uh, we have so many different uh, divisions in the ministry you could be a part of. The art department's part of that. But anyway, it's incredible. And what we do at this place, at the museum, with all of our literature, all of our DVDs, again, we're giving answers, defending the faith, to proclaim the answer Jesus Christ. And so if you get a chance to go to the ARC, you will not be disappointed. You get the, also the virtual reality ride that's really good. Uh, so much fun stuff to do there. You can spend a good day or two at the ARC. And so I really encourage you to check that out. But what we're going to do this morning is lay a foundation for why these answers matter so much. Why are we so passionate about this stuff that we built the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum? We send speakers around the world. Why does it matter? And I'll say this at the beginning. We're so passionate about this because we've realized something I'm sure you guys have realized, and that's this. Our nation is headed in the wrong direction. You've seen that, right? And that's not hard to see. It's not just America, by the way. It's the entire Western world we're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview. But the fact that's happening here in America is pretty astounding because we are, if we're being fair, the most Christianized nation the world has ever seen. We really are. If you think about it, we have more churches than anybody else in the world. Over 600,000 churches by some estimates here in America. We have more Christian colleges, more seminaries. We have more Christian bookshops and radio stations and television stations. Think about it. We have more Christian resources in America than any nation has ever had. Isn't that crazy? But for all those Christian resources, are we as a nation becoming more or less Christian every day? What's the answer? Man, less and rapidly so, right? I think it's fair to say we're becoming more anti-Christian by the moment in our culture. And actually, the secularists know this. This has been prophesied by the secular prophets, if you will. Newsweek back in 2009 had this as their cover. The decline and fall of Christian America. Inside, they made a very good observation. They said the present in this sense, it's less about the death of God, and it's more about the birth of many gods. You see, we used to be one nation under God, but now we're one nation under many gods. Isn't that great? See how tolerant we are? But guys, in truth, at a foundational level, did you realize there are actually only two religions? People say two, just two. Here they are. Either God's word is your authority. And you build your thinking from here. Option two, you reject God's word. What are you left with? Man's ideas in some way, shape, or form as your ultimate authority. Those are your two foundational religions. God's word versus man's. And what we've seen in our culture has been this foundational shift away from God's word as our authority to now man has become the ultimate authority. Man, according to our culture today, determines truth. And by the way, that's why truth is relative according to our culture because each person can decide their own truth. And that's why we look a whole lot like Judges 21, 25. When there was no king in Israel, every man did that which is right in his own eyes. And you would think he's talking about America today with the way our culture looks. And so with this foundational shift, this is why we see headlines like this one. Drag Queen Story Hour brings pride and glamour to libraries across the U.S. Recently, head of Drag Queen Story Hour arrested for child pornography. Big surprise? I don't think so. California proposes curriculum chanting name of Aztec God who accepts human sacrifice. You know, to make the kids less white in accordance with critical race theory, which, is, by the way, is a Marxist ideology and utterly anti-biblical. We're told by the medical experts, don't call pregnant women expectant mothers. That might offend the transgender people. Instead, call them pregnant people. Because as you ladies know, anybody can get pregnant, right? <laughs> I bet you're like, yeah, go for it, fellas. Have fun with that, right? <laughs> if you really want it. Uh, North Carolina preschool uses LGBTQ flashcards depicting a pregnant man to teach kids colors. Mattel had their first ever transgender Barbie doll. Father in Canada was put in jail for calling his daughter his daughter because she identifies by different pronouns. Coca-Cola, along with many other organizations, almost all the big ones, uh, hold anti-racist training that instructs its employees to be less white. 
There could also be white is bad. Whiteness is a problem of our culture, but it causes systemic racism and brokenness, and it's all caused by this ideology, which is rooted in critical race theory. Again, utterly anti-biblical, different talk for a different time. TEDx speaker says pedophilia is a natural sexual orientation. By the way, look out for that. That's coming down the road. We're seeing it more and more. Or this headline, 61-year-old woman gives birth to her own granddaughter for a gay son using his husband's sister's egg. I will give you a second. <laughs> and then one last one, we'll stop just for mercy, all right? But transgender man gives birth to a non-binary partner's baby with female sperm donor. <clears throat> Can we agree for the sake of time our culture has lost its mind? We can agree with that, right? We see that. We, under, we understand that's happening. Our question for, as Christians is why, right? And I think that we think about the question this way. Why isn't the church, why aren't Christians influencing the culture like we used to years ago? You know, think back in Billy Graham's day, right? We suggest this. We're not influencing the culture today. Why? Because of so many cases today, dear friends, it is the culture influencing the church. In so many cases, Christians have compromised God's word in different areas. We've undermined biblical authority. As a result, we're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview. Now, what has taken place? Guys, it's been an attack on the word of God. Yes, outside the church, that is true, but also inside the church. And that has been catastrophic. And the fact that God's word is under attack, that's not new, right? God's word has been under attack since Genesis chapter 3. When the devil said to Eve... Basically this, did God really say? Did he say that? Did he mean that? Do you have to obey that? Don't you know better for yourself? Do what you want to do? Is he really the authority? Notice what he was doing. Getting Eve to question God's word, to doubt God's word, to reject God's word. And the method was so effective, he's used it ever since. Different forms, the same basic attack. And one of the primary ways he's doing this today it's through the teaching of things like evolution and eight men and Big Bang and especially millions of years to get so many people today to watch this, question God's word, doubt God's word, to reject God's word. Same fundamental attack with a key difference, and that is this. Today, it's more of a stealth attack. Today, he's attacking the Bible's history to undermine the Bible's authority to undermine the gospel rooted in that authority. Because here's the bottom line, and this does make really good common sense. If you cannot believe the Bible's history, friends, why trust it about morality, sexuality, or salvation? I mean, if you can't believe Genesis 1-1, why would you trust John 3-16? Bottom line, if you can't trust the beginning of this book, why trust the middle or the end? And for so many people, this is their stumbling block to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even though many Christians have not realized this and really where the attack is being focused today, it's interesting, the secularists, the atheists, they understand a great way to attack biblical authority is to attack the history and thus undermine the credibility of the Bible from the beginning. If you want an example of this, I'll show you a clip of this guy. His name is Lawrence Krauss, professor of physics at Arizona State University, former professor, I should say. And uh, this is from 2009. I want you to hear what he says. Hear the reaction of his students, and as you do, just understand it's a good example of how and where the attack is occurring today. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars, and the only way they can get in, into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus. The stars died so that you could be here today. Okay? And, and anyway. He's great. Forget Jesus. The stars died so you can be here today. I'm never sure which is worse, his statement or the reaction of his students. Right? But notice his basic sentiment, which is this. Forget Jesus. He's not your savior God. Why? He's not your creator God. You're not here because God made you like the Bible says. You're here because stars exploded. He's saying the Bible's wrong about origins. Why trust about anything else? Same basic attack. This guy said later on, that change is always one generation away. So he said, 
if we can plant the seeds of doubt in our children. That sounds a whole lot like Genesis chapter 3, by the way. Religion will go away in a generation, or at least largely go away. And that's what I think we have an obligation to do. Thank goodness he's neutral. <laughs> you laugh because he's not, right? And by the way, nobody can be. We'll come back to that later on. But he's right about one thing. Change is always one generation away. We see it in biblical history numerous times. We see it happening right before our very eyes. According to numerous studies, now for actually decades, an average of around two-thirds of kids today who grew up in active Christian homes walk away from the church by the time they reach college age, most of whom do not return today. Two-thirds on average. And so, of course, I'm sure that concerned you as it did us. So we want to figure out why and what to do about it. So we did a research project with America's research group, uh, Brent Beamer there. And he interviewed a 1,000 of these millennials, those 20-somethings, now 30-somethings, who have grown up in the church and since walked away to try to figure out, okay, what's going on? What do we do? Let me show you two of the major findings. First, when he asked those who had walked away, if you don't believe, key word here, when did you first have doubts? And guys, please notice something really important. It was not college. Isn't that what we tend to think? Our kids, when they're in middle school and high school, they seem fine. I mean, they're crazy, they're middle schoolers and high schoolers, but they're here with us, right? And they seem okay overall. Then they go up to the secular university, and people like Lawrence Krauss, oh, he changes their minds. And that's when they walk away, and they're persuaded by the pressures of sin and that culture and that dynamic. No, according to research, they had all these questions, all these doubts, really starting in middle school and high school, if not before, over 80% of them. They had essentially all these questions that were not getting answered, at least not at church and not at home. What sort of questions? Well, the same sorts of questions I heard for 13 years teaching Bible history in a public school, working with youth in 20 years in different ways. Questions like if the Bible is true, where did God come from? And what about evolution and the ape man? Doesn't that disprove the Bible's history? And by the way, who did Cain marry? And what about dinosaurs in the Bible? How did Noah get all those animals onto the ark? And doesn't carbon-14 dating and radiometric dating disprove the Bible's history? And by the way, where did the water for the flood go? And where did it come from originally? And by the way, what about who did Cain marry? If we all come from Adam and Eve, how explain all these different people groups all around the world? And why is there so much death and suffering in this world? Hasn't science disproved the Bible? Have you heard some of those? Yeah, maybe not that fast, right? <laughs> we hear that because this is really primarily where the attack is occurring today because for so many people, get this, they think the Bible cannot be trusted in this quote-unquote scientific age. It's been bombed out by these sorts of ideas. And then here is the key, and really the gut check for us as Christian parents, leaders, grandparents, etc. They're coming to us for answers. Hey, Christian mom, dad, Christian grandpa, grandma, Sunday school teacher, Christian friend, pastor, if the Bible is true, what about evolution? What about dinosaurs in the Bible? Who did Cain marry? How do you explain the people groups? What about uh, Noah's flood and rock layers and fossils? And, and nowadays, even questions as fundamental as, how do you know there are two genders? How do you define marriage? Where does that actually come from? How do, you, do you have answers to any of these sorts of things? And what has been our, as a church, general response to those sorts of questions for decades? We've been saying something like this. I said it for a long time myself as well. You know what, honey, I don't know about the rock layers or the fossils or the distant starlight or the eight men or whatever, but don't worry about that stuff. Just trust in Jesus. Now, let's be clear. We want them to trust in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Of course, but hear me. When we ignore their questions and we just say that, here's what we're doing. We're ignoring their fundamental question, which is this. Here's what they're asking. Why should I trust Jesus? In your Jesus. Because think about it. The message of salvation through Christ, that message comes from where? The Bible. And mom, dad, grandpa, pastor, if I can't believe this part over here, why should I trust the rest? Either all of this book is authoritative and true or none of it is. And that's the core issue. You see, for so many, what we found is this, is they're walking away, really, in their hearts and in their minds before they ever leave physically for college. They're sitting in our pews, in our homes right now, and they're already gone. That's what was the entire of the book with the research in it, already gone. And we also asked them in the research their reasons for leaving. One of the main reasons for leaving was hypocrisy. And we said, okay, we kind of figured that. But what do you mean by hypocrisy? 
And this is what the majority said on their own. This was not multiple choice. They said, well, we grew up in church. We were told in church that this book, the Bible, is the word of God. Trust what it says, especially that part about Jesus. But then they said, we were told in some way, shape, or form, a Christian family member, friend, leader, that we as Christians, we don't necessarily believe this part of the book. And you can take evolution and eight men and Big Bang. You can take man's ideas, reinterpret this first part. It's not that important. Just be sure you believe the rest of it and you trust in Jesus. And they see it as hypocrisy and they should, shouldn't they? Because that's what it is. And because that sort of compromise, we're seeing so many quote-unquote testimonies like this young man's. Of how I became an atheist. I was born into a Christian family and indoctrinated as uh, growing up <coughs> as a kid. That next year was freshman year of high school, and I started learning about evolution in my biology class. Then uh, that's where I realized I had never seriously questioned or thought about my religious beliefs. So as I learned about evolution and just started thinking philosophically about it, I realized that there couldn't be a God. So I became an atheist. And most likely you know someone who would say a similar thing because of the culture we live in today. And guys, hear me on this. I'm sure that maybe many of you, like myself for the longest time, had the best of intentions when we said, I don't know about that stuff. Don't worry about it. Trust in Jesus. We had really good intentions. But can't Christians, like everybody else, have good intentions and get terrible consequences? It's really possible, right? Now, this, this is a really heavy talk. I get that. So let me give you just a lighthearted example of when Christians had good intentions but got bad consequences. Let me show you some bad church bulletin titles just to illustrate the point in a little bit more of a lighthearted way. All real, by the way. This one, the peacemaking meeting scheduled for today has been canceled due to a conflict. <laughs> Don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. Is that done by committee? Like Frank's getting on my nerves, so we need to vote him off the island, out of the church. All right. Uh, at the service tonight, the sermon topic will be, what is hell? Come early, listen to our choir practice. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I don't care who you are. That's funny. All right. <laughs> and then Barbara remains in the hospital. She's having trouble sleeping and requests tapes of Pastor Jack's sermons. <laughs> Good intentions, right? Bad consequences. And on a serious note, friends, when we compromise God's word with the secular thinking of our day, even with the best of intentions, you'll get the worst of consequences ultimately. And also, according to research, we saw that the way we are teaching the Bible is causing many to struggle with its credibility. You say, what do you mean? Well, so often today when we teach the Bible, especially to younger kids, but not just them, Typical in most Sunday school classrooms or Bible studies. We tend to say, hey, we're going to study this great Bible story today. But what does the word story tend to mean in our modern language? Yeah, fiction, fairy tale, not true, right? And so what people hear, especially kids, but not just them, oh, we're going to study a fairy tale today. A story that has no connection to reality, maybe makes a moral or spiritual point, but not really connected to the real world. And then we show our kids pictures like this. Right? Of Noah's Ark. It's an overloaded bathtub, and somehow giraffes have their heads sticking out some sort of chimney every single time, right? Monkeys on the portholes. And I, I get the, I know the idea is meant to be cute for kids. I do understand that, of course. My daughter's four. I understand that well. But kids are very impressionable. You show a kid a picture like this. Does that tell that child, Noah's Ark and Flood, real event in history or fairy tale? Fairy tale. It's reinforcing what the world's already telling them from so many different angles. And again, for so many people, they have all these questions and they're looking, in many cases, to their Christian connections for answers. And for the most part, guys, in Christianity today, we are not doing apologetics. We're just not. For the most part, we've not equipped ourselves or the coming generations to know what we believe and why. Rooted in God's word. Instead, we just tell stories. And so where do they go to get the answers to all their questions? Well, they go to the only other alternative, which would be man's ideas, secular sources. They go to their secular classrooms, secular courses, their secular teachers. They go to secular sources like YouTube, Uncle Google, TikTok, Wikipedia. And from all those sorts of places, they hear all these secular answers. They get the secular account of origins. They learn about evolution in millions of years and the secular definition for marriage and sexuality and gender being redefined. 
Think about it. What they're getting, don't miss this, they're learning secular apologetics. They're learning all the reasons the Bible must not be true and can't be trusted. What are they getting in church? Stories. And when you think about it like that, it's not so surprising so many are walking away. And guys, that history in Genesis, it's not a fairy tale. It's real history and it's really important. And we summarize that history at the ministry with the seven C's. If you go through the Creation Museum, you'll see those laid out in detail. Summarize at the Ark and all the literature, but seven C's. The first four C's, creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, that's Genesis 1 to 11. That is the real geological, biological, anthropological, astronomical history of the universe that lays the foundation for the last three C's, which is Christ's cross and consummation, a summary of the gospel. And I like to say these seven C's, they're married and they can't be divorced. A few quick examples. Just as it was in the beginning, originally perfect with no death, no suffering, no bloodshed, no disease. Someday when Christ returns at the consummation, he'll make it perfect again. Am I looking forward to that? Amen, right? And then the corruption. Because a real man in real history really did sin. And we all really do descend from that man. That's why we're all sinners by nature and consequently by choice. And we all need saving through the last Adam, Jesus Christ, the God who became flesh and lived a perfect life. He died on the cross paying the perfect, infinite debt we can never pay. He rose from the grave defeating death. If you repent, turn from your sins, put your faith in him alone, you'll be saved. But we have that need of salvation through the last Adam because of the sin of the first Adam. And then the catastrophe, the flood of Noah's day, it's a picture of Christ because in Noah's day, it was a global judgment on man's sin. There was one way to be saved, through the door of the ark. It's a picture of Christ. There's another global judgment coming. It is coming. The next time, it's by fire and for eternity. And there's one way to be saved. Jesus said, I am the door. If by me any man enter in, he shall be saved. Right? John 14, 6, he declared, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father but by me. The text is really clear. It's a picture of Christ. And then the confusion. By the way, again, tomorrow night we will talk about one blood and one race, one Savior for all. And this is so relevant in our day and age. So we love talking about the Tower of Babel and the implications, what we see from that in our world. It explains so much. But in short for now, the Tower of Babel reminds us. That all people today can trace their family trees back to Noah and his sons and their wives. Every person who has ever lived can trace their family tree back to one man and one woman, Adam and Eve. That means, biblically speaking, how many races are there? One, the human race. And again, since we all descend from Adam, that's why we're all sinners in need of saving through the last Adam, Jesus Christ. Again, a direct connection to the gospel. But again, if that first part is not true, then why should we trust the rest? And for many, they would say, okay, Brian, I mean, I get it. That makes sense. But, I mean, come on. It's just Genesis. It can't be that important. And I would suggest to you that's what the devil would love for you to think. Because it's interesting. If you trace this out, every single biblical doctrine, either directly or indirectly, is founded on that history of Genesis 1 to 11. Every single one. A few quick examples. Where do we see the origin and definition of marriage? That's found in the book of Genesis, right? Chapters 1 to 11. Where do we see the origin of sin and death? That's found in the book of chapters 1 to 11. Why do we practice a seven-day week? That comes from Genesis 1 to 11. The only place for that, by the way. Why do you wear clothes? Why do we wear clothes? You are, and that's good, amen? <laughs> it's a good thing right? in our fallen world. That goes back to the book of? Genesis chapters 1 to 11. Guys, how do we know that every person, no matter where they live, United States, Kenya, in the womb, on the moon, no matter their skin shade, no matter their accent, no matter their economic background, how much money they have in their pocket right now, no matter their influence on society, every person has equal, inherent, indelible value because they're made in the image of the living God. It comes from the book of Genesis. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Why is he called the last Adam? Why do we need a new heavens, a new earth? That all goes back to the book of Genesis. Foundation for every single biblical doctrine. If you take away the foundation, the whole structure will collapse. And let me give you just two quick examples of biblical doctrines being attacked by attacking that history in the book of Genesis. First one's a pretty straightforward. Second one's a bit more subtle, but they're equally important. So I think we can all agree 
that the biblical doctrine of marriage is under assault. Easy to see, right? And it's very intriguing. When Jesus was asked about marriage by the Pharisees, he did something radical. He quoted the Bible. <laughs> and he said to the Pharisees, have you not read? Translation, don't you guys read your Bible? That he who made them at the beginning, Mark says beginning of creation, made them male female. That's how we know there are only two genders. By the way, <laughs> I'm going to stop, pause for a second. It's kind of sad and funny. Uh, I was at a conference doing this talk and uh, came to this point and said the same thing. And uh, at that point, I said, that's how we know there's only two genders. Like the people began clapping, right? And they were doing that clap like, man, you just said something bold. Look at you stand. And it got me sad. I'm thinking, I just said there's two genders, and that's bold. But it is today. I mean, I get the, but it shows you where our culture's at. It's really what I'm getting at, I guess. But anyway, he made them male and female and said, For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become. He's quoting Genesis 127 and 224, showing that the doctrine of marriage is based on the biology and the history of Genesis being true. You become one in marriage. Why? It's based on the fact that the woman came from the man, like the Bible clearly describes from the beginning. The woman, praise God, did not come from the ape woman. <laughs> Amen, fellas. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. <laughs> no, the woman came from the man. And uh, friends, as Christians, we can say boldly and, yes, lovingly, but also uncompromisingly, that marriage is between one man, one woman for life. Why? Because the God who made marriage, he made it between one man and one woman for life. Guys, God made it, he defines what it is. And we find that in the book of Genesis. But again, if that first part is not true and or God's word is not the authority, then why not redefine marriage and make it whatever you want it to be? which is what our culture is doing right now, which is why people are marrying their pets today. They're marrying literally their furniture. I saw recently that a woman married a tree. <laughs> literally married a tree. <laughs> i got to say this because it pops in my head. My wife would be so sad right now. I'm going to say this bad joke. The woman who made a tree, she's trying to branch out. All right, anyway, so <laughs> I... Nate and Paul, you cannot tell my wife I said that. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> that's terrible. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then also the biblical doctrine of death and its relationship to Christ's atoning work on the cross is also under assault. You see, what do you mean on that? Well, follow me on this. This is a lot, it's a bit more subtle but equally important. Maybe even more so because it is subtle. Because you see, the Bible's clear that God made the world perfect, and he warned Adam, the day you eat of the fruit, you'll surely die. And guys, the Bible's clear from cover to cover. It was man's sin that brought death, the enemy, into God's perfect creation. Our sin wrecked this world. For the wages of sin is death. Romans 8.22 says, the whole of creation is groaning in pain because of man's sin. And then we see in Genesis chapter 3, the first death of an animal after Adam sinned. God kills an animal for the first time, the first blood sacrifice in a sense, to cover their sin and their shame. A picture of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who comes later to shed his blood to cover our sin and our shame. And most Christians will say, okay, Brian, we're with you and all that, but where's the attack you're talking about? Here it is. If you try to squeeze the secular atheistic idea of millions of years into the Bible, no matter how you try, even with the best of intentions, inevitably you'll put death before sin. And death before sin is theologically impossible for a bunch of reasons. Here are a couple of quick ones. For example, in Genesis 1, 29 and 30, in the original perfect creation, God told Adam and Eve to eat fruit, the animals were to eat plants. Originally, all things were vegetarian, which I know sounds weird to us today, but it makes really good biblical sense. Because originally, when God made everything perfect, there was no death in this world. And if you eat an animal, you're eating something that has died. Right? So you can't eat animals until after death enters the world, and death came after sin. So before man sinned, there's no death. All things have to be vegetarian. Makes really good biblical sense. 
Not until after the flood that God told Noah, just as I gave you plants to eat, now, Noah, you can eat everything. You have that permission now, according to that passage. By the way, this is the reason you can eat a hot dog, because it is everything. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> kids are, the kids are like, why is that funny? Don't worry about it. <laughs> just enjoy your hot dog. All right, buddy. <laughs> But why is this a problem? Here's why. If we reject the Bible's clear teaching and its implications that God made a perfect creation, but then man sinned, bringing death into the world, and about 1,400 or 1,600 years later, there's a global flood that laid, lays down most of the rock layers and fossils we see today. If you reject that and you instead embrace the secular, atheistic, materialistic idea that the rock layers and fossils were laid down slowly over millions of years, Watch this. Long before man ever existed and thus before sin, in those rock layers supposedly laid down before man and before sin, we find lots of evidence of animals eating each other. But the Bible says before man sinned, all things were vegetarian. We find that same fossil record, lots of evidence of diseases, things like brain tumors and cancer and arthritis, they're everywhere. But before man sinned, the Bible says God looked down on day six before man sinned, and called everything very good. Surely God would not call millions of years of death, suffering, bloodshed, cancer, disease very good. If he did, it wouldn't be a very good God. And by the way, think about it. If this were true, it makes God the author of death. Part of his original very good creation. And in a real sense, by embracing this, we're actually blaming God for death instead of our sin. We find thorns in the fossil record that some would say are millions of years old. But the Bible's clear thorns came after the curse, right? Actually, they're a symbol of the curse. That's why Christ on the cross wore the crown of thorns. He bore the curse on our behalf. And then most important of all, if you try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, no matter how you try, and I'll talk more about that tonight, day-age theory, gap theory, progressive creation, so forth and so on. And even with the best of intentions, and to be really transparent, I tried for a long time myself. I've been there. But no matter how you try, inevitably you'll put death before sin. And watch this logically and theologically. If there were death before sin, that would mean death is not the consequence or payment for sin. This has always been around, part of God's very good creation. And if death is not the payment for sin, then Jesus' death does not pay our sin debt. And we just undermine the foundation for Christ's atoning work on the cross, whether we meant to or not, and at best made that event in history unnecessary. And can I tell you a little secret? This is why we care so much about these issues. Please hear me. I enjoy talking about the age of the earth and giving answers about radiometric dating and distant starlight. That's, I enjoy doing that, but that's not my passion ultimately. The passion is defending biblical authority and the gospel rooted in that authority. That's what's under attack. That's what's at stake. That's why it matters so much. Here's the bottom line, dear friends. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not begin in the book of Matthew. And I like Matthew. But it starts in the book of Genesis. It truly does. That's why it matters. And some would say, okay, but then wait a minute. Are you then telling me that someone's got to believe in a 6,000-year-old universe and a global flood and a literal add-on to be saved? Are you saying it's a salvation issue? We are not. Never have. What's the Bible say about salvation? Romans 10, 9, right? Confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus, believe in how God has raised him from the dead, and believe in a young earth and six little days and a global flood, and you'll be saved. That's from second heresies, I think, maybe? Maybe third heresies, I'm not sure. I one or the other. <laughs> no, we were saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, plus nothing. So this is not a direct salvation issue, but it is an indirect salvation issue because where does the message of salvation through Christ come from? It comes from the word of God. And again, if you can't trust this part over here, why trust it over here? Dear friends, here's the deal. We don't have the right nor the authority to treat God's word like a buffet. I'll take some of John 3.16, but not Leviticus 18. That gets a little hairy today, right? And not Genesis 1 to 11. I'll take Philippians 4.13 out of context or stuff like that. Either it's all authoritative or none of it is. 
And that's why it's so important that we are obedient to God's command to give an answer for our faith where the attack is occurring today. And I think so many Christians aren't doing this because we have bought numerous lies from our culture. One of those lies is this, that you can't use the Bible to do science because the Bible is not a science textbook. Our response is, you're right, it's not. Praise God, those change every year. But where the Bible touches on science, we can trust it. And here's what it does for us. It gives us the big picture of history to rightly understand things like biology, geology, anthropology, astronomy. It gives us the right understanding of the past that we apply to the evidence in the present. And that's really important because we all live in the present. Right? Right? Raise your hand if you're with me in the present. Just a quick check. Oh, very good. Think about this question. Don't answer out loud unless you really want to. But think about this. It's helpful to clarify some issues here. When do fossils exist, past or present? And the answer is they exist in the present. If they did not, we would not have them. Right? And you got to realize when you find a bone in the dirt, that bone does not come with a label on it saying, hey, I'm 65 million years old, made in China. <laughs> or whatever. One might think, right? But anyway, and guys, here's the point. We made it in the first session this morning, but we'll make it again now. I'll probably make it a couple other times because it is so important. Again, all the evidence any scientist has exists now in the present. All scientists, biblical scientists, secular scientists, compromised Christian scientists, have all the same stuff in the present. The same rock layers and the same fossils, the same radioisotopes, the same distant starlight, all observed in the present present. But here's the deal, once again, they interpret those things differently in the present. And they make different guesses about where those things came from based on their different starting assumptions about the unseen past. And as we said earlier, if you start with the wrong assumptions, you'll get the wrong conclusions. Like a frog with no legs goes deaf. Only first session people get that, all right? <laughs> wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions. And dear friends, we must realize this, that there is no such thing as neutrality. That's another popular secular lie today. We've got to be neutral. There's no such thing as neutrality. The Bible's clear on this. Either you gather with me, Jesus says, or you scatter. Either you walk in light or you walk in darkness. The mind set on the flesh, flesh is hostile towards God, not neutral. Please hear me. There is no such thing as neutrality ever. Either God's word is your authority or it's not and man's word is. And at that point you're asking which man? And most of the time it defaults to their own person. I'm my own authority, I become my own God. A lie as old as Genesis chapter 3, by the way. And recognize that there is, recognizing there is no neutrality, dear Christians, and we stand on God's word. And we do so boldly, yes, lovingly, do God's will. God's way, but uncompromisingly as we stand on God's word. As we do so, we've got answers, and I tell people all the time, they're just not that hard if we just trust the Bible. Build your thinking from there, there's some really good answers. I'll give you a little taste of that now. We'll do more of this later on tonight and tomorrow, but we can answer questions like this one. How to Noah get all those animals onto the ark? Well, if you start with the Bible, this really isn't that hard to answer. First, look at the biblical dimensions. The ark was a really big ship. Over 500 feet long and 85 feet wide and 51 feet tall with three different levels, literally a floating warehouse. Anybody in here been to the Ark Encounter? Oh, wow, a lot of you have. Very good. Who's not been to the Ark Encounter? There's time to repent. That's okay. All right, very good. <laughs> Just kidding, all right? <laughs> Just joking. But, uh, but, hey, if you haven't gone yet, many of you have. That's awesome. If you haven't gone yet, when you do go, wear good walking shoes. You're going to need them. All right, it's a really big vessel. It takes a while to get around all that stuff. It's a huge, but to give you an idea, if you can see there, there's a person sitting underneath the ark, a huge vessel. This was not Noah's ark. I banish that picture from your minds, all right? Get rid of that. And then the Bible's clear. God brought to Noah two of each land-dwelling, air-breathing animal according to their kind. And again, the word kind in the Bible, for the most part, is equal to about the family level of modern-day classification. So what that means practically is this. Noah did not take 400 pairs of dogs on the ark. He most likely never saw a chihuahua or a poodle in his life. <laughs> he was a blessed man. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, he took two of the dog kind, two of the elephant kind, two of the horse kind, just two of the major kinds of animals. And taking them at the level of kind, land dwelling, air breathing, they fit with no problem on that massive boat. And then if there was a global flood, as described in the Bible, we expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. And that is exactly what we find. It is amazing. Someone say, but I thought it took a long time to make a rock layer. Not at all. Water, dirt, minerals, right conditions, you can make rock layers really quickly. A couple quick examples. Here's a ship's bell encased by rock. Here's a clock in a rock. There's a spark plug in a rock. Of course, those things are not millions of years old. Or you might remember Mount St. Helens erupting back in 1980. From that eruption, you get rock layers, huge rock layers. And literally hours they formed. Or canyons like this one. Nicknamed the Mini Grand Canyon because it's 140th the size of the Grand Canyon with very similar features to the Grand Canyon. And it formed that canyon in nine hours. Just watched it happen. Great observable evidence. It doesn't take that long to make those sort of structures. What you need is that catastrophe. And if you want bigger rock layers and bigger canyons like seen, seen around the world, you need a bigger catastrophe, maybe like a global flood described in the Bible. And some say, but then what about fossils? I was told those take a long time to form. Actually, no. Typically, to make a fossil is a rapid process. You have to bury something deeply and quickly to protect it from scavengers and decomposition. <clears throat> a few examples of this rapid process. Here's a petrified ham. <laughs> a ham that turned to stone in less than 60 years after being buried. What do you do with it? Nobody knows. <laughs> but there it is. Here's a fish fossilized in the act of eating another fish. This was pretty much instantaneous. This poor guy did not get to finish his last meal. And that's why I call this fossil the Last Supper. Just <laughs> equal parts groaning and laughing. I, I'll, I'll take it. All right. Uh, here's an ichthyosaur fossilized in the act of giving birth, which does not take millions of years. Again, this was instantaneous. And then speaking of recent burial and recent formation of these fossils, we find literally all around the globe now, more details tomorrow night, uh, we're finding soft tissue from dinosaurs still intact in their bones. The tissue is still literally stretchy and pliable. Oftentimes you'll find blood vessels and red blood cells still inside that tissue. And those organic remnants should not last more than hundreds of years after the creature's death. Maybe thousands of special conditions like after a flood. No way, millions. Great confirmation of the biblical time scale. And I could go on. We'll see more of this confirmation later on, of course, in the other sessions. But my point for now this morning, if you put on those biblical glasses and have that biblical worldview, stand on God's word, you can indeed defend your faith. And also, let me make this comment as well. This is not a battle between two equal worldviews. Like they're equal in veracity and quality. No, God's word, the biblical glasses, they're also corrective lenses. Because we all have a spiritual sight problem called sin. It helps us to see the world correctly. But again, real science will confirm the Bible again and again. But ultimately, this battle always boils down to this foundational battle of God's word versus man. That's what's happening in our culture. We're seeing this foundational shift. And you see, when you start with God's word, we look back in our culture, build your thinking on God's word, there's a foundation for absolute morality, a foundation for defining marriage, sanctity of life, defining gender and sexuality. You abandon God's word, what are you left with? Moral relativism. Man decides truth, redefine gender, redefine sexuality, redefine the sanctity of life. We've seen this foundational shift away from God's word of the man's in our culture. We now have multiple generations, both outside and inside the church because of compromise, who no longer build their thinking on God's word. We're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview as a result in summary. So what do we do about it? We'll sum up with these classic castle diagrams from our ministry. Ken's been using these for roughly 40 years as he gave these lectures around the world. They've evolved a bit, but uh, can I say that? But uh, same basic message. And, of course, the castle on the right represents Christianity built on God's word as its foundation, the foundational history of Genesis 1 to 11, and the biblical doctrines in the gospel that come out of that foundation. And the castle on the left represents secular humanism, the idea that man can determine truth, which, by the way, is the dominant, hear this word, religion of our culture today, supported by your tax dollars, by the way, in multiple ways. But notice that the humanists, driven by the enemy, whether they recognize it or not, 
are being very clever today. Don't focus your attacks on the deity of Christ or the virgin birth. I mean, you attack that, but don't focus there. No, focus your attacks on the foundation, on that foundational history of Genesis 1 to 11, because they understand that once this foundation goes, what will happen to the structure? It will collapse. And then notice the Christians. You'll recognize some people here. Some have no idea what's going on. Some are utterly asleep, right? Some are fighting each other over typically trivial things like uh, what color should the carpet be? You know, how do you brew your coffee in the church, dark or light? The answer is obvious, dark. Why are we talking about this? All right. <laughs> Come on now. All right. And then, of course, there are many who are right here. And by the way, again, just to be really transparent, I was here a long time for myself who are saying, you know what, we don't need that history in Genesis. Maybe God used evolution millions of years, just trust in Jesus. And guys, what they're doing, whether they realize it or not, destroying their own foundation, actually helping the enemy, maybe with the best of intentions, but destroying their own foundation. And by the way, just so you know, the guy in this picture is wearing a suit and a tie. It's on purpose. Because sadly, he, re he represents the majority of our pastors and Christian leaders in our culture who have abandoned God's word as the authority starting in Genesis. The vast majority have done so. And they raise up the coming generations of leadership in our culture as well. And that's a big problem. But for now, I think most of us, we resonate with this person right here. We look out to our culture and we see all these sorts of social ills and we say to ourselves, we've got to fight against these things. And we should. Fight against those things in truth and in love. But friends, as we do fight against those things, let us understand this foundational issue. Those things, those red balloons, hear me, they are not the problem. They are the symptoms. They're the symptoms of a loss of biblical authority in our culture today. And think about it. For all the time and money and effort we've put forth as the body of Christ fighting these symptoms, is it working? The answer is we're becoming less Christian every day. Why isn't it working? Because in a real sense, by just attacking the symptoms, we've been playing checkers. The enemy's been playing chess. We're dealing with symptoms. He's been attacking the foundation of our faith and the faith of our children. You see, by just dealing with the symptoms and ignoring the foundational issue of who's the authority... But just dealing with the symptoms, in a sense, we're trying to Christianize the culture, to make the, Christ, make the culture more Christian-y. Because we like it that way, to make it more comfortable for ourselves, ultimately, in a lot of cases. But the Bible doesn't say go into the world and to Christianize the culture. The Bible says go into the world and preach the what? The gospel. And to teach all nations, to make disciples, that through God's word, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through a defending of the faith, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ by the power of God's word and his spirit, God changes people from the inside out. That will change our thinking. That will change our worldview. That will change our culture. We're losing this quote-unquote culture war because we are fighting the symptoms and not the source at the foundational level. So what is the solution? In a word, stand. Stand on the authority of God's word because, dear friends, this is a battle ultimately over authority. And you cannot defend biblical authority by abandoning biblical authority. We stand on God's word. We equip ourselves and we raise up generations who know what they believe and why rooted in God's word from the beginning. Who can give answers to deal with the symptoms by going to the source. By standing on God's word. Bottom line, only by standing on God's word can we effectively defend the faith and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And don't miss this. Because we understand that fundamentally the answer to the problems in our culture is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Always has been the answer, always will be the answer. But that gospel stands on the authority of the word of God, which begins in the book of Genesis. And that's why it matters so much, and that's why we're so passionate about it. And that is your introduction to who we are to the conference and why, again, we're so zealous for this and want you to have these answers in the real world in a real way. I want to get you equipped to do so. A few things we highly recommend. First, as I mentioned earlier, the answers in Genesis website. That's our website. There are literally thousands of articles and videos free on the website answering so many questions. Of course, you know, I'm talking as fast as I can without being totally uh, 
where you can't understand, hopefully, all right? Not talking too fast, but I'm trying to squeeze in a bunch. But if you want more in-depth answers, the website's a great place to go. It's all free there. Check that out there. And then we brought these special bundles with us. First of all, this one. You can get all five for $70. The book, Divided Nation, basically what you just heard in book form, all right? The same content, same ideas, fairly short book, easy to read. Also, there's a link in the book where you can go and download the slides that, Ken's u- that Ken uses to give this talk. So if you like this message and want to share it with others via, you know, a Bible study or something like that, you can go and do that using the book Divided Nation. The book Will They Stand, basically applying this to parenting, really a wake-up call to parents to realize what's happening in our culture. And if you want your kid to stand today, they better know what they believe and why. If they don't, it doesn't look good in our culture today. And then Creation of Babel, this is a commentary and kind of like a devotional too on Genesis 1 to 11. It's a great thing to do as a family devotional or personal devotion. It goes to Genesis 1 to 11 with Ken's comments from Ken Ham, our founder. Really well done. One race, one blood, dealing with the race issue from a biblical perspective. Powerful answers. Again, tomorrow night we'll talk about that. And the answers book one, there are four of these. We brought answers book one with us. Each book answers around 30 different questions and each chapter is a different question. So you can read them out of order, great reference tool, phenomenal to have at your disposal to defend your faith and equip your kids to. And then we have the kids bundle as well. You can do this one, One Blood for Kids. That's a great book, by the way. Um, in a sense, it has the same message about we all come from Adam, one blood, one race, equal in value. Great message there. But also, I would say it's good not just for kids, but it's good for adults. Because the content is still really good and meaty. Not too much, but good meat. And then it's got this added bonus. Lots of colorful pictures which I really like, all right? And so it really helps kind of really bring those ideas home as you read through it. But it's still got really good meat. Uh, the Door of Salvation, a great presentation of the gospel. And then Answers Books 1 through 8, they come in one big pack, but 1 through 8. These are answers for kids. They're a real question from a real kid with a paragraph answer, basically. And I'm going to tell you, this is the honest truth. As I started reading these with my kids, I was learning stuff. And I teach this stuff, all right? So the answers are really well written to really engage even the parents and grandparents as you read them with your kids. It's good for everybody. You can do all 10 of those for 70 or do all 15 of those for 125 if you would like. And then if you need some short answers, we have a book called Quick Answers, Two Tough Questions. It is the best book of the ministry because it is my book. So just throwing that out there. Just getting it right. But, uh, but no, it's short, concise answers. So each answer is less than 500 words. It's very quick, very concise. Again, as I mentioned earlier, very ADD friendly on that. And so questions like who, uh, how to know get the animals onto the ark, what about dinosaurs in the Bible, carbon-14 dating, who did Cain marry, all these sorts of things answered in the book, science and the Bible more or less. And then I wrote another book called Quick Answers to Social Issues, 37 biblical answers to the social issues of our day. We give biblical answers to issues of life, equality, sexuality, and environment. So I'm going to give you biblical answers about um, abortion. Euthanasia, stem cell research. What about social justice? What about uh, homosexuality and the transgender movement? What about climate change and the green movement? Biblical answers to all those things. And again, they're short and concise. And so you can check that out as well. And you can get those two books as a separate deal, just two for 20 if you would like for those two. Or you're welcome to swap out any of my books for any of the books in the other two previous packages if you want to do that as well. You can swap them in and out if you want. And then we have the Answers Magazine as well. We bring the sign up for that. This thing is awesome. It comes out quarterly. And so that's 70 p- some pages long. It deals with current issues from a biblical worldview. Really well done. And then there's a separate kids magazine in it that kids love. Scientifically proven by my son who is reading at 15 months because he's advanced. <laughs> he says every parent ever, right? But anyway. Um, but he wasn't reading. He was looking at pictures like his dad. But anyway, he's enjoyed that. But actually, the magazine for kids is really well done. It's about, I think, 30 pages for the kids. Lots of great activities, good information, often biblical worldview. It's really well done. So it's like two magazines for one. Then you get the digital as part of your subscription as well. That's another addition to that. You actually have the articles read to you if you had the digital version of this, which is really neat. And I believe we have the DVD special as well. Ask Nate or Paul about the DVD special for the magazine, if that's going on for the conference. You can sign up for it there. And I got to mention this, and we are so excited about this. Of course, nowadays, I don't know about you, but many people pretty much stream a lot of what they watch on TV anymore. So we have our own streaming platform called Answers.TV, you know, like Netflix or Disney Plus or something like that. But I would say this, this is a lot better because it's safe for the entire family, teaching biblical truth for kids through adults. And... Um, 
Have you kept up with Disney lately? I mean, I, I could easily plug them in. Oh, yeah, you're not keeping up. That's good. But I'm sorry, keeping up with what, what they're doing. If you look, they're being very vocal nowadays about their goal of winning people to their worldview, to their religion. And their religion is this woke ideology of the LGBTQIA plus movement. And the president basically said not too long ago of Disney, he said this, we want to use, not really politics, although they're going to kind of do that too, but that's not what will be our focus. He said, we want to use the stories we tell and the likable characters we create to real people, especially your kids, and to this secular woke ideology. If they're not neutral, nobody can be. So you got to be careful really about what your kids are watching, even on Disney nowadays. And so we love Answers TV for a lot of reasons, but number one, it just gives you a safe alternative to give you good biblical content for the entire family. There's over 5,000 videos on the platform, lots of content, and it's only 40 bucks for the entire year. So that's like 3.30 a month, basically. It's a really good deal. And then I did mention this earlier, but we are hiring, right? And like everybody else, we need workers. But I'm telling you, Answers in Genesis is an awesome place to work for so many reasons. You guys aren't that far away. Uh, but uh, it's amazing to do something uh, so unique and so big under the banner of Christ. And it's so cool to be a part of that ministry. And there's so many different ways you can be a part of it. So check out the link there if you want to look into that. We'd love to have you. And then... Depending on if you're becoming, I encourage you to come back for the later sessions. Again, tonight we'll talk about the age of the earth. We'll talk about rock layers and fossils. Tomorrow night will be dinosaurs, and we'll talk about one blood, one race. There'll be some Monday morning sessions for kids. We'll bring your kids to that about dinosaurs and stuff like that. But if you think of something later on, you can find me on Facebook in particular. Send me a message there. We'd love to connect with you guys there. But again, the point of all this, truly, as we go through all this stuff, is to stand on God's word, to be equipped to defend the faith, to give answers, to proclaim the answer, Jesus Christ. That's really what this is all about. Because the gospel begins in the book of, it truly does. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word and your truth. We thank you for your body, your bride, the church, and how you use us in amazing ways for your glory. Lord, would you give us a passion for you, for your word, for your truth, for the lost. Lord, for the body of Christ, may we lovingly, powerfully, uncompromisingly stand on your word to be salt and light lord to have a passion for the loss to have a passion to see your name glorified to be obedient to you out of love for you would you guide us to know what we believe and why lord help us to put in the work that's necessary to make that happen help us lord to be able to set aside the distractions of this world whatever those may be for us to focus in on you and to not only equip ourselves but lord our kids and our grandkids that you've given us, given to us. We are to be good stewards of these precious resources that you've put in our care for a period of time. May we be, be found faithful in equipping ourselves and them to stand, defend, and proclaim your glorious news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Lord bless you, Brother Brian. It was awesome. Let's Thank give you. him a hand. Oh, it was nice. good. All right. Go get something to eat. Take a two-hour nap and be back at 6 o'clock. All right? Lord bless you.
We hope you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you visit with us in person. For more information, please visit our website at gpnd.net or contact us by phone at 317-535-3512. You can watch us live and view past services on our website, Facebook, or YouTube channel. Until next broadcast, may God richly bless you as our prayer.